but um, I'll do so again. Jope uh, is an activist, an author, an author of Life, uh, Li Life with Albinism, Filled with Pearls. Uh, that's a very poetic title, love it. Uh, also a TV personality, uh, founder of an NGO. Maybe you'll uh, get a chance to tell us a little about that going forward. So, uh, and you're from South Africa. Uh, we also have um, a lady who has written a book called, uh, she's uh, Rennie Edo Lodge, and she's written a book called Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race. Another great um, uh, title. And uh, we, uh, in response to that title, we decided to bring a white person to talk about race with you. And so we have Gavin uh, Evans, who has written uh, Skin Deep, Journeys in the Divisive Science of Race. So to kick off this session, the best way for our guests to introduce themselves is for them to give you a taste of what they've been writing about. So I think I'll start with you, and then we'll just take you one after the other. Please treat our guests to a short passage of, uh, of your writing. Thank you very much. Um, I'll read a passage from my book, and this is, uh, this is actually at school, so this uh, child with albinism is, is starting school. So anyway, he said, there was a desk, there was a big desk and one chair in front of the class, Many smaller tables were put in rows. Each desk had two orange plastic chairs. At the back of the class were big pictures of animals with names written below them. Tsepo assumed that they were the names of those animals. He then sat next to one learner who refused to sit next to him, saying, uh, you'll turn me white as you are. Um, which, made, which made many of his classmates laugh. Therefore, Tsepo sat on a desk alone as their teacher was not yet in. This was not what he had envisioned school would be. He looked around and felt out of place. There was no one similar in color to him. Other kids were happy running around the class and he was silent and confused in his thoughts. Thoughts that were far too painful for a seven-year-old child. Um, so yeah, this was when he was starting school, I think, yeah. Although I see you've got a copy of my book. Can I borrow it? I didn't bring my own. No, I, I know exactly which one. Thank you. Uh, while Rennie is jumping uh, to the page, something you may not have, uh, have noticed, and this is a testament to Lola's um, uh, uh, skill in putting panels together. Just look at what we've got here. We've got a gentleman who's white, but he's a black man. We've got a, a lady who is black. We've got a gentleman who is white. And we've got a guy who's neither. I'm somewhere in the middle. So we have full diversity on this panel. Over to you. OK, this is about a five-minute re reading. Is that OK? All right. On the 22nd of February, 2014, I published a post on my blog. I titled it, Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race. It read, I'm no longer engaging with white people on the topic of race. Not all white people, just the vast majority who refuse to accept the legitimacy of structural racism and its symptoms. I can no longer engage with the gulf of an emotional disconnect that white people display when a person of color articulates their experience. You can see their eyes shut down and harden. It's like treacle is poured into their ears, blocking up their ear canals. It's like they can no longer hear us. This emotional disconnect is the conclusion of living a life oblivious to the fact that their skin color is the norm and all others deviate from it. At best, white people have been taught not to mention that people of color are different in case it offends us. They truly believe that the experiences of their life as a result of their skin color can and should be universal. I just can't engage with the bewilderment and the defensiveness as they try to grapple with the fact that not everyone experiences the world in the way that they do. They've never had to think about what it means in power terms to be white. So anytime they're vaguely reminded of this fact, they interpret it as an affront. 
Their eyes glaze over in boredom or widen in indignation. Their mouths start twitching as they get defensive. Their throats open up as they try to interrupt, itching to talk over you but not really listen because they need to let you know that you've got it wrong. The journey towards understanding structural racism still requires people of color to prioritize white feelings. Even if they can hear you, they're not really listening. It's like something happens to the words as they leave our mouths and reach their ears. The words hit a barrier of denial and they don't get any further. That's the emotional disconnect. It's not really surprising because they've never known what it means to embrace a person of color as a true equal with thoughts and feelings that are as valid as their own. Watching The Color of Fear by Lee Manwa, I saw people of color break down in tears as they struggled to convince a defiant white man that his words were enforcing and perpetuating a white racist standard on them. All the while, he stared obliviously, completely confused by this pain, at best trivializing it, at worst ridiculing it. I've written before about this white denial being the ubiquitous politics of race that operates on its inherent invisibility. So I can't talk to white people about race anymore because of the consequent denials, awkward cartwheels, and mental acrobatics that they display when this is brought to their attention. Who really wants to be alerted to a structural system that benefits them at the expense of others? I can no longer have this conversation because we're often coming at it from completely different places. I can't have a conversation with them about the details of a problem if they don't even recognize that the problem exists. Worse still is the white person who might be willing to entertain the possibility of said racism, but who thinks we enter, enter this conversation as equals. We don't. Not to mention that entering into conversation with defiant white people is frankly a dangerous task for me. As the heckles rise and the defiance grows, I have to tread incredibly carefully because if I express frustration, anger, or exasperation at their refusal to understand, they will tap into their pre-subscribed racist tropes about angry black people who are a threat to them and their safety. It's very likely that they'll then paint me as a bully or an abuser. It's also likely that their white friends will rally around them, rewrite history, and make the lies the truth. Trying to engage with them and navigate their racism is not worth that. Amid every conversation about nice white people feeling silenced by conversations about race, there's a sort of ironic and glaring lack of understanding or empathy for those of us who have been visibly marked out as different for our entire lives and live the consequences. It's truly a lifetime of self-censorship that people of color has to live. The options are speak your truth and face the reprisal or bite your tongue and get ahead in life. It must be a strange life, always having permission to speak and feeling indignant when you're finally asked to listen. It stems from white people's never questioned entitlement, I suppose. I cannot continue to emotionally exhaust myself trying to get this message across while also towing a very precarious line that tries not to implicate any one white person in their role of perpetuating structural racism, lest a character assassinate me. So I'm no longer talking to white people about race. I don't have a huge amount of power to change the way the world works, but I can set boundaries. I can halt the entitlement they feel towards me, and I'll start that by stopping the conversation. The balance is too far swung in their favor. Their intent is often not to listen or learn, but to exert their power, to prove me wrong, to emotionally do me, and to rebalance the status quo. I'm not talking to white people about race unless I absolutely have to. If there's something like a media or conference appearance that means that someone might hear what I'm saying and feel less alone, then I'll participate. But I'm no longer dealing with people who don't want to hear it, wish to ridicule it, and frankly, don't deserve it. I'm going to read from the last chapter of my book. It would be a happy delusion to assume that a book like this could be more than a slow puncture in the next bubble of racist science. And one thing we can be sure of is that more bubbles will blow our way. We can also be certain that the battle over ideas won't be a fair fight. The claims made by race science invariably get more of a hearing than the antidotes. Yet it is a battle always worth fighting. As soon as we allow the baseless idea that some races are genetically endowed to be smarter than others, the corollary, some are stupider, 
always applies. And if some have evolved greater or lesser intelligence, what else comes with the package? What other qualities do they have or lack? Dumping the idea that races are real in a biological sense is a good start. Although we use the term loosely in various contexts, it is worth remembering that race is little more than a convenient linguistic shorthand. Yes, geneticists can tell from which geographical area or population group people come using DNA analysis that can detect telltale markers. Yes, particular diseases and physical capabilities or liabilities are more prevalent in some population groups than others. But population groups are never racially pure. And what we consider to be races, in fact, compromise many population groups. Race is a solid scientific category, not least because each of the commonly defined races contains almost the full human genetic range, which means that the differences within a race, in inverted commas, are more profound than those between races. An alternative idea, deeply rooted in science, embraces a different concept of race, of a human race with ever looser populations that flow one into next, sharing their genes ever more quickly as international travel becomes easier and borders become more porous. In those 7.8 billion bodies and minds, regardless of nation, region, tribe, or ethnicity, can be found the entire range of human capacity, albeit a capacity mediated by wealth and poverty, by family custom and religious belief, by education, by heat and cold, trees, mountains, deserts and buildings, by viruses and microbes, by nutrition and hunger, and by everything that falls within the cultural realm. Despite these huge cultural and environmental differences, we can be sure of one thing. In any population we choose to name, we'll find in roughly equal proportions the full spread of human nature, cruelty and kindness, violence and gentleness, madness and sanity, inventiveness and unoriginality, idiocy and genius. This idea of the human race is worth fighting for, but we should never assume that we have won the fight and can go home and put our feet up. When I wrote and broadcast about race science five years ago, I was regularly told I was wasting my time because no one believes that stuff anymore. I don't hear that now. With the rise of the alt-right, fascists taking to the streets all over Europe, populist nativist right-wingers winning power in several parts of the world, far-right terrorism on the increase, it is clear that racism and the ideas that feed it are more resilient than we hoped. The 20th century showed us where bad ideas about race can lead. If we don't want the 21st to echo those themes, bad ideas need to be countered whenever and when, wherever they appear. This book has been my effort. Thank you. So three. Uh, thought-provoking uh, passages there from our writers. Now, let's get into some of the issues. Uh, I'll come uh, back to you, Mpo. Um, I think probably the, I have thousands of questions for, for you, really, that I'd, I'd love to ask, but probably the most, uh, the one that comes to me first is that, unlike the experience any and all of us will have had of, of racism, you uh, and anyone with albinism has a unique uh, tinge to it, uh, and that is that even in your own country, you, you experience discrimination from people who are, should be the people who are really embracing you. Um, can you talk a little bit about that, and, and does that have 
a, a, a nexus with, with your ch such, such a, a, a lyrical choice for your title, which is sort of sweet and gentle, you know, a life full of, of pearls? Um, yeah, um, you, I, I grew up in, in South Africa where um, it was like a section, we still have um, sections where it was white people and then black people. So what would happen is that I would go to town where it's dominantly white, and they would still say, you know, you, you, you are not one of us. Um, you, you are black. And then I would go to my own community, which is um, where we are black. And they would say, no, you are a white person. You are a child of a white person. And so for me, race started when I was like six, seven years before I could even comprehend many things. And it's even, I think it's not even highlighted a lot, but it's worse than racism because now racism is hatred from the other from the others who you don't belong to but now when it comes to your from your own where you can't even go to school where you can actually be killed just because you are different it still says the same thing that um, we as black people we are complaining about how white people are mistreating us but yet we can mistreat the same people I think it's if anything else as black people we should be able to understand the pain of isolating and apartheid and everything else, but if it's done by the same people who have felt the pain, it's, it's very worse, it's really worse, yeah. Thank you. Um, so, coming to you, Rennie. Um, let me play um, devil's advocate here a, a Okay, I'm bit. very used to that. <laughs> yeah. Um, reading your book, um, I got the feeling that as you walk through life, you became suddenly, well not suddenly, but it was fairly swift, very, very aware of this issue and uh, the depths of its uh, tentacles, black person living in, in, in UK. But at the same time, isn't there a layer that is almost inviting pushback? If we call everything out, if we analyze everything, if we put everything out there and say this has caused this and caused that, doesn't that create a second uh, level, a sort of backlash? Uh, we're busy complaining and then people are complaining about us complaining too much about everything, structural racism and, and uh, all this identity politics. Do, is it a bit too much, don't you think? Do you think we're causing a bit of a problem? Hmm, I don't know. I mean, I guess like I could opt to say nothing um, and the, the structural racism would still exist. Um, and so, I don't know. I think it, but it might not still exist if we just get on with being us, nice, friendly, lovely, whatever you want to be, but the and evidence just show people that, hey, whatever you're thinking, you're barking up the wrong tree. The evidence doesn't really show that. I mean, I used to work at an anti-racism think tank in London, and um, I was struck by, I was like a lowly intern, and my job was basically to collate every public report that was published about like racial inequality in Britain. Um, and so there, were, there was in the public sector, it was in the private sector. So I'm collating all of this inf information about, you know, education um, from schooling, you know, at, at 11 years old, right up to higher education at university, right up until, you know, you're applying for jobs in the health or you're, you know, trying to access a healthcare system or perhaps you're interacting with the criminal justice system. And repeatedly, over and over again, I saw that if you're black, you fare worse off in these systems. Um, somebody who's 11 years old, who's, you know, in year six um, and having their papers marked for their SAT, so those are the exams to get into secondary school, um, you're, you're marked lower by your own teachers. Um, if you're black, and that's something that's rectified by anonymous marking by somebody who doesn't know you. When it comes to going to university, you're less likely to get into the best universities. When you're graduating from university, you are less likely to get the highest marks. When you're applying for jobs post-university, people with African and Asian sounding names um, are less likely to be called into a job interview than people with white British sounding names, regardless of whether or not they've got the same qualifications and experience. Then when you're in the job, there's an, there's an ethnicity pay gap, regardless of the level of education that you have. Um, if you interact with the criminal justice system, which you're more likely to do if you're black, um, you can get sent down for drug possession um, for a longer sentence, even though white people are more likely to to take drugs. So repeatedly, over and over again, I, 
you know, I'm collecting this inf information, and I do this in the book. I like plot it along the um, like the life the lifespan of a hypothetical person, and I'm like repeatedly in every institution that we respect to treat us fairly. There's this drastic bias. Um, and even if you just keep your head down, try to get educated and try to get that job, um, you're still, you still face the bias. I was shocked the most by data on the ethnicity pay gap because, you know, I, went to, I was a child and I was told, okay, just work twice as hard, get your education, get your good job. But the data on the ethnicity pay gap shows that the people who are even more educated in Britain but are black still earn less than their white counterparts, still. So that actually flew in the face of everything that I'd been told. Um, it just... Now, I'm not saying that everybody has to take up the mantle of challenging it, you know. I think a lot of my work is challenging it so that other people perhaps don't have to, or, you know, if they're having a situation with, at work or with their colleagues or friends in which they're seeing these dynamics, they can say, oh, well, maybe you could read this book. They don't actually have to engage directly in that conversation. I, I recognize that, you know, particularly if you're, if you're trying to create a situation of security, it may not be the, um, like the most wisest thing in the short term um, to challenge racism. But, you know, I think it was Martin Luther King Jr. He said that the, the arc of, the, the future like arc of, like it bends towards justice, but that doesn't happen without our intervention. Like we can't just expect for things to get better and like rely on other people do that for us. Some of us have to intervene, not all of us, but some of us have, have to intervene. And so, you know, while I like respectfully, respectfully understand your perspective, and I think that's one that I certainly grew up with, um, I do think that some of us have to essentially like put our, our necks on the line to, to challenge it. And, you know, my book, uh, despite your use of the word complaining, I can tell you that it isn't just complain. You know, I came up as a freelance journalist, a jobbing journalist, so for me, it was about collating that data and putting forward that, that evidence, uh, you know, data from different agencies, public and private, some evidence to do with my own investigative journalism and like research and going through the archives to evidence a feeling that I think many black people in Britain have, which is just an uneasy feeling of unfairness. And I wanted to get that conversation moving from anecdote to fact. Evidence-based, yeah. Just a little point. Remember, I said devil's advocate, so it's not my, my perspective. No, I understand. I, I, I went through a lot of what you uh, went through, and that's why I said in your book um, was, was very relevant um, to me. So, um, Gavin, um, your book is also, I mean, it's very different in, in flavor, but it's still, it's about evidence, the evidence uh, of racism. But you go much more into the scientific side of, of things. Now, for me, I, I have a scientific background, and I feel almost like freedom of speech. There should be freedom of science. There should be no topic that is, um, uh, that, that is uh, off limits for scientific investigation. But the feeling I get is that this is one topic that science had just better steer clear of because possibly we just don't, we're afraid of what the answers might come out or the problems they may cause. What is after, you know, what, what is your conclusion at the end of it? Because very strongly what you're saying is that, look, science has, has probably been at least interpreted simplistically, um, but uh, my feeling still is at the end of all that, that you would rather scientists steer clear of, 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 of uh, race um, investigation. No, not really, because it's, um, it's out there. We, we, more and more, you're getting people, um, which we, we call the alt-right, but um, basically exist in the blogosphere, on YouTube, um, and they're putting out uh, scientific-sounding ideas um, that say that different population groups have different inherent capabilities. So the current one that's been pushed out there, um, it started with a paper by three Utah anthropologists, all of whom had a history of um, writing in the realm of race science. And they put out a paper arguing that Ashkenazi Jews, European Jews, um, were innately more intelligent than anyone else. 
And now, I won't go into their, their, their argument um, uh, because it will take a long time. But in every area, their ideas needed to be interrogated because you had people who were very prominent in public life, um, in particular the evolutionary psychologist Steven Pinker, who supported that idea, who said that that was right. Um, and if one embraced that idea, well, everybody knows that Jews are smart, um, then what happens is that you're then embracing an idea that different population groups have innate um, capabilities. And that's the kind of slippery slope. So one then needed to look at whether that idea was true. So I, among other people and various scientists, looked at, at the claims that were made uh, that Ashkenazi Jews were innately more intelligent. One of them was that they were an isolated ethnic group. In fact, genetic tests show they're very far from isolated. Like everybody else, they, they um, on the matrilineal line, 80% of their DNA um, comes from European rather than Middle Eastern sources. Another claim that was made about them was that certain diseases they had were pathways to higher intelligence, um, ethnic diseases. That also proved to be, have, have no validity. So one needed, I, I could carry on, but one needed to go through each of their ideas, examine them, and show why they're wrong. Now, that, I, that idea has been absolutely demolished. It still doesn't stop it being put out there. Jordan Peterson, a very famous um, psychologist of the alt-right, um, con continues to say that Ashkenazi Jews are innately more intelligent. So one constantly needs to look at that, examine the claims, and show why they're scientifically wrong. Because without that, you're leaving the field to people like Steven Pinker and Jordan Peterson. Uh, let me push you a little bit on that, because in, in your book, you, uh, I think when you were talking about the, the bell curve and Charles Murray and, and the infamous um, podcast with Sam Harris, and I, I happened to, to, to catch that, and I was glad I did, because I've always seen Sam Harris as somebody who is determined to get to the truth, and I felt that his stand was that, look, we can't be afraid of what science is going to tell us. But what we have to do is do good science and then interpret it well and, and not in bad faith. And I felt that he was therefore defending the scientists, not for the message or the result, but just for the fact that they have to do the science. Now, I felt that um, you, you read that particular interaction differently. And, and, and that comes to me, to the core of this. If we're going to understand ourselves better, we must do the science. Yeah, so, so um, just a little bit of background on that. For, um, for those of you who don't know, uh, race science comes in waves. And the last big wave, we're in another big wave now, but the, the previous big wave was a book called The Bell Curve, which came out um, in, in 1994, and claimed that the reason that um, uh, that, that, that poor people were poor was not because they grew up in bad circumstances, but because they had lower IQ, lower and uh, associated IQ with intelligence. Now, there's a difference between IQ scores and real intelligence, which is a different question. And then the, he went further, the, the, the authors of the bell curve, um, and said that the reason that there are more um, poor black people in America is because they are innately less intelligent. So this was a, a blatantly racist book. What Sam Harris then did, who was a very famous um, uh, blogger um, and author, a very prominent atheist, um, and someone who uh, um, prided himself on, on interrogating ideas wherever they came from, so he, in, he then looked at the bell curve, and he gave it a huge endorsement. This is 25 years later, after every one of its premises has been absolutely demolished by science. And he promoted this book, but not from the point of view as, let's hear your argument and interrogate the argument. He gave this long, soft soap um, stroking of the author, of the, the remaining author of the bell curve. And really, what he was doing was promoting it. 
Um, he was not critical, it was not a critical analysis um, of the book, and that was my objection to it. Not that, that you're examining ideas, but how you examine those ideas. If I may, I, I think it's also important to, under, to you know, really push, and I'm sure your book does this, Gavin, the political context in which race science emerged. It's really convenient to, um, that, that science emerged you know, in a colonial context in which it, ooh, suddenly it just justifies that black people should be enslaved. How convenient, do you know what I mean? Like, and I think it's really interesting how these like, so-called like, stand, like, reasoned, objective atheists just aren't really that interested in interrogating white supremacy as a social creation that, like, a, a, that, like created race. You know, the writer Ta-Nehisi Coates, he says, you know, race is the son of racism, not the father. And it's really convenient, actually, that all of these so-called objective, like, Super duper incredible intelligent atheists. Uh, for some reason, that's that's just a given, <laughs> you know. Um, you, race is a is a racist creation um, that emerged in science that was coming up in a context that was attempting to try and justify genocide and oppression. Like that, that is a basis that we have to. That I mean, I've come to that position through interrogation of of white supremacy as a political construct, which I think is a political construct as much as capitalism is. And I think it's really convenient to just, to not interrogate that and just start from the, the place of like, oh yeah, why are people poor? Poor people poor, I guess they just deserve it and they're just not that smart. Very true. Um, uh, on a slightly lighter note, uh, when I started your, your book, um, uh, the title, of course, is quite provocative, but I did have to laugh because you probably never talk to more white people about race now than when you wrote the, that blog article and then obviously the, the book. So it's kind of, you brought it, you've brought it on yourself and you can't keep to that promise. Yeah, but you know, the second line of the blog post is not all white people, just the vast majority who refuse to accept the legitimacy of structural racism and its, and its symptoms. Uh, go, if you don't refuse to accept it, let's chat. You know, <laughs> I don't, and, and I am happy to say that, you know, since the book's come out, you know, I live in London, 94% of journalists in London are white, despite it being, despite journalism being concentrated in the southeast of England, which is the most diverse multicultural area of the country. One million black people live in London. Um, so you've got the bias in the industry. So whenever I find myself speaking to a, a white British journalist they're like, who are like, ha ha, you're speaking to me, I'm like, well, the odds show that I would be speaking to you. It'd be unusual if I wasn't. Um, like, for me, I think that it's been a happy thing that the quality of the conversation has changed, that I'm no longer speaking to people who just want to be like, oh, well, nothing to do with us, racism, that's over there, that's the far right. Um, I think that like, we should absolutely interrogate what white supremacy is as a political construction, as the basis of what we understand knowledge to be, like, full stop. Okay, thank you. Um, before we go uh, to the interactive part, uh, Umpo, I'm, I'm sure you were, uh, want to say something on that. And then after that, I'd like you to also tell us a little bit about your NGO and, and what it's, it's doing. But yeah, um, I was saying that um, it's what is what I find very interesting is that as humans, whether different, whether black or white or um, whether it's different topics, is even if it's topics about um, gay or lesbians, we always it seems to me the challenge is we always focus on how different we are instead of what how common we are in the sense of I mean I can say um, a white person still is part of human race or uh, whether this person is that instead of finding how right we are or how it's running with ideas and I think that's where the challenges we find ourselves as human race in so many challenges because instead of saying okay you are part of the human race and let's debate what are the challenges what we do is we say well uh, this is um, like the topic where it says um, this race is more intelligent or this, these people are more lesser, whatever. Instead of saying, okay, we are part of human, how can we sense what 
combines us, what connects us, instead of finding out what is, what is, um, what is separating us. And with regards to the NGO that we do is um, we, we do albinism work, we do advocacy and we link with others. So we mainly focus on changing the narratives because with, ne with albinism is always focusing on the, the negatives or the, the side or the abuse part. But I believe that, as the, the book says, it highlights the challenges, but also the victories, because there are, you can graduate as a person with albinos, you can do business, you can do sorts of things. So um, what we do is we go to schools, we bring learners with albinism who are in high school, and we bring professionals with albinism who are like your doctors, your lawyers, so that they talk to these learners and show that they can be more than what just the society is telling, because many, narratives about albinism is only about the killings, it's only about the sad stuff, and no, no victory can be seen if you only focus on what is the negative side. We need to balance the narratives in so that we can show that there is an overcoming, and also link with other countries, um, because part of the challenge is that the people who are doing killings, they can move the body to another country with and then the body from South Africa will be in Mozambique or vice versa or something. So there is a need for us as different organizations in Africa to link and say, what are you doing there? What am I doing there? So that we link and we eliminate this or else, because the killing started in Tanzania, it was rife and then what happened was there was intensified efforts to stop it and then it moved to Malawi then it moved to, uh, so it's always moving around until we come, we work together and it's, in, it's even joyous because yesterday I was meeting with other guys who, uh, they have an NGO here and they were like, well, we, we are keen on working with you so that we do this in Nigeria and then so that we do it in all the other parts because Africa we are one regardless of who says what, yeah. Thank you. That's great. So I'm sure, um, wow, the room has just filled up completely. So we're going to have lots of questions, I'm sure. Um, nothing controversial here to talk about. Anybody got anything to chip in? Right. So I'm going to start over here and work my way across. Uh, do we have a microphone? We do have somebody carrying a microphone. The lady in red. Please Hi. introduce yourself, and then uh, if you are targeting your question at a particular guest, please uh, okay. inform them. Hi, my name is Fatima Zara Umar. Uh, I noticed that nobody talked about colorism within the black community. There seems to be a preference for black babies to be a particular way, to look a particular way. I'd like um, the panel to address that. Thank you. Thank you, colorism. Um, I think we'll take like two or three questions and then we can have a batch of answers. I see a hand, another lady in red. Okay. Hi, um, my name is Fatima Adimola Suni. Um, I have two questions. One is for Gavin. Do you, do you think um, the media and the availability of um, you know, social media is mainly responsible for perpetuating stereotypes about race and racism now, considering the fact that even if something isn't true, people tend to carry it, especially if they've got social media followers, even when it's not true, it's not been proven. That's um, the question for you, Gavin. Then for Mpo, my question is, as a person with albinism, do you ever notice that class and financial status has something to do, you know, influences the way people look at albinos. Reason I ask is that in Nigeria, I've noticed that um, albinos that are well off tend to be, you know, taken care of. If they come from a wealthy home, they have access to sunscreens, they have access to, you know, doctors and Medicare personnel everyone treats them differently from the person on the street. I have, you know, two cases of that. The gentleman on the street, nobody cares. Um, in Nigeria, they just call him Afin, which is the word for, you know, an albino in this part of the world. But for the um, 
albino that is well taken care of. They call her Oimbo. So do you ever you know, see that, that a lot of times the financial status of the albino also influences the way people you know, address and treat them? Thank you. We'll take one more before we start answering. I have a lady there in the light blue dress. Um, hello, um, Adia Yosola. My question is going to be about white people and black people, um, white people appropriating, let's say, black culture, because in the idea that race, in the idea of racism, black people are seen as lower, as lesser than white people. But then we find that white people appropriate black culture, they take things from us and make it cool. Why? I want someone to address the fact that something black, I mean, it's from black people. Why is it better when a white person has it? And why do they have to, it's like whitewashing our culture and then making it cooler for them? And then, so the, the basis of the question is to find out why, to, for someone to address the fact that black people, everything about them is supposed to be inferior, but then, white people take it and make it seem classy. Um, why? I went through supposed to be inferior to them. So why did they take stuff from us and make it, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so there's quite a few uh, nice deep topics there. Let's start with you, uh, Gavin. You. Okay, well, um, uh, maybe I should start on the question of colorism because I do have a section in my book dealing, um, dealing with colorism. Um, now, the, what is the origin of, of, of colorism? In other words, the, the origin of um, lighter people having prejudice against darker people. And it's obviously related to, to racism. And so one of the things I look at in my book is the impact of both slavery and colonialism. So when the slave owner is, uh, um, is white, when the, when the colonist is white, then things that are lighter tend to take social preference. And so within the slave system, also within the colonial system in several countries around the world, people who were a mixed race or mulatto were given better positions. And so that's um, possibly one of the origins of colorism. I also look at another origin, possible origin of colorism, um, which goes way, way back in, in um, human history. Now, what we now know from full DNA analysis um, is the origins of different population groups. And basically, the population groups around the world bear no resemblance to the ones that existed 5,000 or 10,000 years ago. So if we look at Europe, the original Europeans, who were hunter-gatherer people in Western Europe, were dark-skinned people um, who had black hair and, oddly, blue eyes. Um, and those are the hunter-gatherers. Now, we know that from DNA analysis. What happened then was that there were a wave of people who were farmers who came down from what is now Asian Turkey um, and, and, and settled and pushed these, the hunter-gatherers, the dark-skinned people, into the corner. Um, and then you had another wave of people 5,000 years ago, five, five and a half thousand years ago, who came down from the Russian steppe. And they populated the whole of Western Europe. They brought with them pneumonic plague. They were also very, very violent or warlike people. And so the hunter-gatherers got either wiped out or they left very little of their DNA in the, among modern, um, among modern um, uh, Western Europeans. They also, the people from the Russian steppe, also populated India. So the Brahmin people in India have more DNA from the Russian steppe than the people in south of India. Now, if you think of that, the, the farmers and the herders who are lighter-skinned people pushing the hunter-gatherers who are darker-skinned people out, and we know when people colonize, they tend to dehumanize the people they're colonizing, and when they are enslaving people, they do that as well, or, or even more so, and you start to see possible origins of colorism that might go back even before modern colonialism and modern um, slavery.